Yarım pare pare Göz yaşım kanun değil Yürek bağrım pare pare Göz yaşım kanun değil Sen ne dedim Sen ne dedim Sen ne dedim ay. Sen ne dedim Sen ne dedim Sen ne dedim ay. Sen ne izzet Balmigan Hem de tapdim Seni izlep top almayan hem de takdima. Sali hecrizin nalan körerme Körermen canı zaur mi Bana yarep nesip esev Ne bulgay gül zaur mi? Tapi pişkim kemel anda Ondağ kiruyi Uamı kul Kilip pervan yenglik Öyrülür Öyrülür içem imaz ağırmi Eger gül perdede Bulsa ne çöp aram Mümkün emez secrit Hasıl kılmayın erşi Hızan bergi kebi berbat Eyley kerni barim ni Dağ bin Bil Gerer Sarı niye? Her yer o sarı. 
My name is Shane McCausland. I'm the head of the School of Arts. Uh, very warm welcome to this evening's event. 
which is live streamed around the world and recorded for posterity. Uh, it is so much more than just the inaugural professorial lecture uh, of my ethnomusicologist colleague, Professor Rachel Harris. Uh, it's also a screening of a, a video short, and I'll come to that later. And it's also a, a mini concert, as you've just heard. The ensemble we have all just expressed appreciation for is the London Silk Road Collective. They are a loosely affiliated group of musicians and sometimes dancers uh, with roots and interests in Central Asian musical traditions, led by singer Rahima Mahmood and Rachel Harris. And over the years, they've included many uh, SOAS students in the group, and they've done quite a few gigs right here in the Brunei Gallery Lecture Theatre. Uh, let me say two quick things uh, on housekeeping. One, mobile phones for silent, please. Second, the emergency exits, should there be an emergency, are either side of me here and up there. Professor Rachel Harris, let me say a few words about the woman of the hour. Now, her Twitter account uh, self-describes her interests as being, quote, in Uyghur expressive culture, politics of religion and heritage in China and Central Asia, unquote. Alas, it's been some time since she was able to work in China on Chinese soundscapes. Uh, though she, of course, continues to nurture the careers of some very fine young scholars from China. Uh, Rachel began her academic career reading Chinese as an undergraduate at Oxford before completing her MA and her PhD in ethnomusicology here at SOAS, where she has remained as a scholar ever since, and her growing academic stature has been recognized or was recognized back in 2019 with the conferral of the title of professor. Uh, in recent years, she has uh, um, increasingly, perhaps necessarily, turned her attention to working with the Uyghur communities living in Central Asia, outside Xinjiang, and in countries like Turkey, and also uh, turned her attention to transnational Muslim music and soundscapes under the rubric Makam which she has defined as, quote, a field of modal concepts, musical practices, and structures, and surrounding discourse found across the Islamic world, from Morocco to Indonesia, in di diverse contexts from Quranic recitation, elite court traditions, and Sufi ritual practice, unquote. And I think it's fair to say that the geopolitics of Rachel's specialism have made her more than just an outstanding and a prominent ethnomusicologist, which at core she is, but have also called upon her to become a public intellectual. And though she might not believe it, this has also made her an inspirational leader to other scholars. Looking back over Rachel's promotion papers from 2018, 2019, which I did uh, before uh, this evening, and I'm gonna cherry pick a little bit, but I was reminded once again of her outstanding uh, research contribution. Her portfolio of um, publications at that time included uh, two monographs and one forthcoming, four edited volumes and a fifth under review, 13 journal articles and one more forthcoming, eight chapters in books with three more forthcoming, five chapters in textbooks and four CD recordings. And that was just the pick. Uh, she also had an enviable track record in grant successes, and she had by then supervised eight doctorates to completion. In teaching, uh, we identified, uh, uh, she identified a distinctive collective approach to learning, which had been recognized by the regulator, and she was a member of the department here, music department, that had been rated gold in the TEF um, pilot rating. And she had also been the lead editor of a Routledge textbook on world music, which had promoted the SOAS approach to undergraduate teaching. So Harris has been an asset to her field, deeply engaged in the professional bodies, editorial boards, festival juries, peer review colleges, the work that uh, does not simply make a discipline function, 
but also defines its values and determines its direction. And it, it really is a great pleasure for me to be able to stand here in front of so many of her colleagues, her students, her friends, and her family to welcome her to the SOAS Professoriate, formally, a richly deserved and already widely celebrated academic promotion. Now, in a second, we're going to hear uh, Rachel's inaugural lecture, which will, be, uh, which will end with a final musical performance recorded. And then we have a reception outside to which everyone is invited. But next in the program, allow me to introduce the premiere, premiere viewing of a short original piece of video artwork, especially commissioned for this event, titled A Poem About Exile which has been curated by Rachel's colleague um, and fellow ethnomusicologist and long-term collaborator, Mukades Mujit. Uh, Mukades will speak after the film and then introduce Rachel. poem about exile. I love traveling, I would say. At least I always thought so. I remember taking a walk one day during winter break back from college at my parents in the evening suburbs, not forgetting a pack of secretly purchased cigarettes and a pair of earphones playing zombie over and over again to the wheat field where I grew up stealing grapes from the tree by the roadside. I sat there under the tree, finally able to light up a cigarette but looking around anxiously. There was nothing but the flat white snowscape. I looked up, the sun was strong even in the winter. A warmth that sometimes only showed up once a week and was not as strong as now, even during the hot summer in the southwest city where I was privileged enough to go study. I guess that was why I felt at home instead there in Africa. So the sun was burning. I remember looking at the white snow-covered land, thinking, what's out there if I kept walking? So I walked, knowing the answer subconsciously, yet stubborn enough to keep walking. Now, I don't remember the exact beauty of my homeland at that moment, just that it was a paradise. But I do remember stopping when I saw two men passing by on horseback, thinking, oh, they maybe know my dad, and likely they'll make fun of him and his weird little girl and turn him back, so I left. The answer to that curiosity about what would be out there if I kept walking didn't just show itself by just walking, it took five years of my life. Exams after exams, meaningless jobs that I promised to keep so I could afford the next flight, a two-faced show like it's my goddamn talent. Damn right I was a two-faced, oh I still am, I was born with it. You made sure I was born with it. It also took a diploma that came two years late because it's a goddamn joke out there, yet legit enough to have me keeping the paper that allows a citizen to move freely in my own hands, not yours. Can't even tell if I was smart, privileged, or just lucky to find the little loopholes in your policy, like water running through rocks on the mountain. I guess at least I deserve a break and stay. But that was an escape for me at that point. I thought I loved traveling. I thought I chose fully, voluntarily, so I could smoke my cigarettes on the street, so I could listen to Dollary singing zombie live. And if I knew what that song meant when I walked through that snowscape, and too bad she passed away before I made it, so I could answer that curiosity without that worrying about what the neighbors would say, so I could be a free-spirited weirdo if I wanted to, so I could. Flight after flight, city after city, 
job after job until I found myself on the other side of the planet. A whole volcano blows up. Hundreds of thousands of my people got locked up. Those horse riding men could be two of them. Like the hate you spread for centuries wasn't enough. A crime human made a hundred years ago and was supposed to learn the lesson from. Replace that burning warmth that mother's son blast off with. Don't tell me it was only Germany or Rwanda. What was the point? of growing up watching all those movies if their meaning could change if you simply change the country oh i don't even have a country today i am capable of answering my curiosity allowed by a stamp on that piece of paper that i was brave enough to keep that i waited and prayed for day and night for two whole months yet still hoping that someday i could go back to that snow covered land under the burning sunlight enjoy greedily and laugh and cry in peace i know for a fact that if that ever ever happens i will remember it this time till i close my eyes to my grave Good evening. Thank you very much for being here and watching this emotional uh, video art. I want to thank Rachel Harris, Professor Rachel Harris, who came to me with this idea of um, making a short film for this special event. And she actually, that was her idea to work on the theme of uh, exile. Um, and I reached out to some very young and talented Uyghur artists and um, um, intellectuals in the in the diaspora and um, this is really amazing to see like how collective um, efforts and energy can create something really beautiful and moving and um, all the um, the voice and the movement and the sound is created by Uyghur artists living in Paris they're all in the situation of exile because they left home for the reasons that you obviously know and um, the person who wrote the, um, the text, she is the last of um, Uyghur exiles from, like she, she is the last of one of us who left home. Like she came to, to France recently by uh, traveling through several countries. And um, when I reached out to her to ask her, can you write a text about exile she graciously accepted, but at the same time, when I received the text, I was blown away by the, 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 the strong anger that she had. That was really, she was very explosive and angry at some too big of forces that force us to leave home. And, um, and I thank all those young people who are courageous enough to still wanting to be creative and do something. Even though they, they, they stay anonymous, but as, as you see, they, they still want to protect their loved ones, but they, want, they still want to be vocal and let the world hear their voices. And, um, and I want to thank Rachel for, for all the work that she has been doing. I'm so sorry I'm emotional, but She's such an amazing person that I'm so lucky to be part of her work and part of her life. And um, um, some moments that we spent together in the field was truly 
a beautiful moment in my life and I saw like how much she understood Uyghur culture and how much she invested in Uyghur culture. That's, that's humanity and that's love and that's beautiful. I would like to invite Rachel Harris to come on stage. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> I, I want to celebrate you. Thank you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your um, invitation. Honestly, it's a bit of a cliche to say how grateful you feel, right? But I really do feel grateful. It's so lovely to have you all here. Thank you for coming. And really very lovely to have a all these amazing people on stage with me. Ah, so, there we go. So, I've been working now for some 25 years um, with Uyghur music, Uyghur cultural heritage and religious expression. And the position of the Uyghurs as a marginalized Turkic Muslim people within the People's Republic of China has never been an easy one. But the past five years have seen a, a huge crisis in the Uyghur region, mass incarceration, cultural erasure, and crimes against humanity on a, a truly massive scale. Since we first became aware of the crisis, um, we've all changed in many ways, I think. Some of my Uyghur friends have transformed into very effective political campaigners. Many of my fellow academics working on Uyghur culture and history have worked hard to document and to raise awareness of these abuses. Um, just to name check a few, Darren Byler and his work on the high-tech surveillance systems, uh, Laura Murphy and Nirula Elima and their work on forced labor. Um, all of those making the links between what's going on in the Uyghur homeland and the complicity of governments, companies, and even universities in the West. So in a situation like this, what is the role of an ethnomusicologist? Or perhaps more broadly, what is the role of the arts, of cultural expression uh, in a time of intense political violence? Or even following debates within Uyghur exile communities, is it appropriate to engage with artistic expression to sing and dance when the nation is in crisis. For me, through this time, two things have been important. And the first is a method of research that really lies at the heart of our discipline. That is ethnography, a direct, personal, sustained engagement to better understand experiences of rupture, dislocation, and loss. And the other is uh, this kind of work with artists and activists um, trying to help to amplify their voices and to support creative and cultural initiatives. So my, my latest book, which came out last year, um, began as a study of religious expression amongst women in Uyghur villages. But as the crisis unfolded, uh, the, the subject matter shifted really to deal with, um, really to confront directly the ways that Uyghurs were responding to the growing repression uh, and then to engage the ways that music was, is being used by the Chinese state in the project of disciplining and re-engineering Uyghur bodies and minds. I've also been working along with Mukades uh, and other partners in Turan University in Kazakhstan on a cultural development project which uses a form of gathering called Meshrep, involving food and music and dance, as a way to sustain Uyghur language and culture and strengthen local communities. And uh, there will be a, another amazing documentary film coming out soon. But today what I want to do is not to focus on uh, past research, but to tell you a bit about something I've been doing very recently um, just over the past few months. So it, it's a bit rough and ready, but it's very fresh. Uh, and this is work with the Uyghur exile community in Istanbul. So 
Three weeks ago, I was in Zeytinburnu. It's a suburb of Istanbul. It lies just outside the old city walls. Uh, for some 500 years, this area was the center of the leather trade, uh, which was dominated by earlier minorities in Istanbul, Greeks, Jews, and Armenians. Long-term residents of Istanbul still remember the stink of the tanning hides in this area. Now the tanneries are gone, uh, their odour has been replaced by traffic fumes, uh, and the area has become home to waves of new migrants, uh, especially from Central Asia, Afghans, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, and Uyghurs. Uyghurs have been present here for several decades, but their numbers have grown massively over the last five years, as thousands of Uyghurs fled their homeland, escaping that heavy surveillance and the mass incarcerations of China's so-called people's war on terror. In Istanbul, they live precarious lives. They're cut off from family and home, uh, often traumatized by glimpses via social media of their children or their partners or their parents who have been sucked into the camps or orphanages, so-called. They're often harassed by Chinese security services, and most of them are unable to access permanent residence or work permits in Turkey. But in spite of all this, the community is organizing and putting down roots. Uyghur businesses have sprung up along the main street. There are tailors, grocer shops, um, restaurants, selling amazing Uyghur food. There's Lagman Polo, uh, some really amazing samsa. And there's even a Uyghur bakery selling fresh naan bread. The smell wafts out of the shop onto the streets. It's incredibly evocative of home. That bakery is now memorialized in a poem by a young Uyghur poet called Hendan. Uh, it was recently published in the contemporary Uyghur anthology, uh, a great project led by the Tarim Uyghur Youth Network, uh, which um, aims to highlight emerging Uyghur voices. If you walk down one small alleyway in Zeytinburnu, you can find a microcosm of Uyghur exile life. There's a grocer's on the corner. Uh, a bit further in is a Uyghur dress shop. And um, a few steps further is the Nuzugum tea shop. It's run by the Nuzugum Society and Family Association, another great organization, which is helping Uyghur women to find work. Uh, they bake traditional Uyghur biscuits, and they provide uh, training in tailoring. Opposite the tea shop is the Greater Turkestan Relief Organization. All of these organizations, regardless of their political or religious affiliation, seem to maintain the same formal offices with the, the big desk and the chair, flags and portraits. This um, Greater Turkestan Relief Organization is run by the charismatic and youthful Mehmet Haji. There he is with my husband. I'm sure you can, well, I'm not sure if you can work out which way is which. Um, Mehmet Haji, there he is, uh, is the 11th generation spiritual leader of a Sufi lineage from the city of Kashgar. Uh, for many years, he's been living a nomadic life, doing business, moving between Istanbul and Kashgar. But for the last five years, he's been unable to return, cut off from his wife and children, one of his sons um, thrown into jail, a common enough story. But Mehmet Haji is focused on helping the community in Istanbul. He has a charity and it distributes food, uh, staple food items and also cooked food once a week to the poor and needy in Zeytinburnu. And this, this charitable tradition is deep-rooted in the Sufi lineages of Kashgar. His lineage belongs to the Nakhshbandi Sufi order, whose founding saint is buried in Bukhara. Mehmet Haji's ancestors arrived in Kashgar in the late 19th century from Namangan, across the border in today's Uzbekistan. In Kashgar, they founded 
popular and influential medrasa and Hanukkah, um, religious schools and Sufi lodges. Mehmet Haji told us how Kashgar's Isham, the religious leaders, organized weekly events on Fridays uh, where a huge pot of food was cooked and distributed to the poor afternoon prayers. This will be followed by an all-night gathering of Sufi followers. Uh, they call it Zikri Sohbet. Um, let me play you a little bit of Mehmet Haji uh, really evoking the experience of these gatherings. <laughs> really interesting how his explanations are echoing uh, these written treatises, historical accounts going back hundreds of years. Uh, and also, as you can hear, how he's um, conveying so exactly the rhythm and the breathing of those chants. So the, the places evoked by these sounds and stories are now thoroughly erased. The main Hanukkah in Kashgar were already demolished decades ago in the 1950s. Uh, the new um, Chinese authorities feared the Sufi lineages. Uh, they feared their ability to mobilize popular support against them. Um, the remaining streets of Kashgar's old town that you see in these photos taken from the 1990s, these were demolished in the early 2000s. Uh, they've been rebuilt since then in a tourist-friendly facsimile of the historic town. But these Zikha gatherings continued underground um, throughout the late 20th century and into the 21st. And the memories of rhythmic sound and bodily movement continue to reverberate across borders even today. These recreations of Zikha chants were something we heard a lot in our field work. Uh, Mehmet Haji is not on his own in his exile. He's actually part of a transnational network of Nakhshbandi Sufis. And you can access the experiences of these uh, gatherings, the Zikri Sohbet, uh, in, in other ways. There's another member of their network. He's an old Nakhshbandi based in Mecca. He's got a YouTube channel and he's posted quite a lot of videos of these gatherings. Let me play you a short clip from one that he posted a few years ago. <laughs> Yes, you can tell that it's a music lover who um, shot that video. He's positioned himself right next to the, the harpies, uh, the guy whose job is, it is to sing those beautiful melodies over the rhythmic zikr. Uh, and you could also perhaps hear the wailing of one man who's been overcome by the emotion of it. These, these gatherings are always intense, effective experiences, uh, which is why, of course, they're so firmly lodged in the memories of people who attended them even many years in the past or many thousands of miles distant. 
But let me zoom out um, for a moment from this storytelling. Uh, I want to link back to that last song that we played for you, the last live song. That um, was a piece from the Uyghur 12 Mukam, from Chebiat Mukam. It's a part of the national canon of Uyghur classical music. Uh, it was much recorded, transcribed, and performed on stage by professional Uyghur musicians through the 20th century. But actually, it's drawn directly from the Sufi repertoire, uh, and it forms formed a part of the gatherings like the one you've just seen there. I, I really love this body of songs. Uh, it really was the, the rhythms that first drew me into this research topic. Uh, we sometimes call them limping rhythms or egg-shaped rhythmic cycles, um, the cycles which have composed of unequal beats. There's an ecstatic quality about them when the group comes together, when we're locked into the groove. Uh, it's especially well-suited to the Sufi gathering and generally good to play when it works, which it did. <laughs> ah. uh, here's the same piece that we just played, um, performed by a group of Sufi followers in a meeting house at a holy shrine in the desert near Khotan. This was actually shot um, as part of a film by a Chinese documentary filmmaker uh, called Liu Xiangchen. <laughs> This music works on the body and the soul in various ways. So the rhythmic groove is there. And you probably also notice these um, incredible percussion sticks, the sapaya. Um, they do a, an incredible job of um, disrupting the atmosphere, producing this deafening, shimmering effect uh, that also, I think, enables the movement between emotional states uh, that enables the dervish's spiritual journey. Uh, one of the Sufi followers we met in Istanbul brought his own pair of sapaya all the way on his journey uh, from Kashgar to Istanbul and keeps them carefully wrapped. So that historic shrine where this was filmed uh, in the early 2000s uh, was an important pilgrimage site for Uyghurs. It was demolished along with many other sacred places around five years ago. But the memories of these places, of course, lives on. Memories and sound link to the spiritual landscape in powerful ways. Another member of that transnational Nakhshbandi network, a businessman now exiled in Dubai, shared with us a memory of a pilgrimage he undertook some 10 years ago a pilgrimage to the site of the first acceptance of Islam in the Uyghur homeland, the place where the 10th century Karahanid ruler Sultan Bughra Khan met the religious teacher Abu Nasr Samani. Listen to his story. <laughs> Şöyle işte böyle 
من آلة القوم نرى آلة الجهاد وجينا نحكيهم مثل ما قال إكس أو بات جراوز بآلة مثلاً نجيبوها لكن برحوا نقول هذا These sacred places, these sites of pilgrimage, play a major role in Uyghur histories and identity, um, and especially the holy shrines where Islamic heroes and teachers are buried. I used, actually, an image from one of these shrines on the invitations for this event. This was taken by the um, excellent New York photographer, Lisa Ross, and it shows here three of the 12 gates the pilgrims uh, walked through on their way to worship at the shrine of Imam Jafar Sadiq. This practice of pilgrimage, ziyaret, visiting tombs of saints, is just one of the many kinds of journey which are historically and today central to Uyghur experience. Thinking about these terms and the evolving ideas about journeys they denote, narrows the gap between spiritual journeys and the experience of forced migration and exile. Uh, more words, terket yol. Um, this is how followers refer to the spiritual journey, the path of the Sufi orders, the path of the Sufi path, you might say. <laughs> um, hijret, uh, on the other hand, some of the more orthodox Uyghurs we met in Istanbul referred to their exile as a hijret from the Arabic hijra, um, evoking the prophet's migration from Mecca to Medina, migrating, as they told us, from the abode of disbelief to the abode of Islam. These terms and the way they're used also connect people to contemporary religious and political affiliations. But most common is Musapir, a wanderer or exile. Many Uyghurs in Istanbul refer to themselves as Musapir. It's a term with special resonance, endlessly evoked in Uyghur poetry, including all the songs you've heard today. That first song we sang for you from Nawa Mukam is set to lyrics by Baba Rahim Meshrep. He's perhaps the archetypal wanderer, a Musapir lamenting his exile, but he's also a kalender, uh, an itinerant Sufi. He sometimes, uh, Meshrep is sometimes called the Merry Dervish. He wandered between the cities of Bukhara, Kashgar, and Yekent in the 17th century, confounding conventional morals with his tricks and um, jokes, uh, mocking powerful rulers. The influential decolonial theorist Walter Mignolo identified trickster figures like Meshrep as models for the developing of new forms of what he calls border thinking, ways of thinking which resist colonial epistemologies. Uh, and this pleased me mightily when I read it. I've always had a soft spot for Meshrep. But of all these journeys, of course, the most important is the Hajj the pilgrimage to Mecca, the duty of every Muslim. If we look at a map, um, it helps us to visualize the multiple journeys made by Uyghurs over the centuries. And scholars of Sufism, notably Hamid Algar and Alexandra Papas, uh, have been working over the past few years tracing these historical pathways of pilgrims from Central Asia undertaking the Hajj. And their roots um, took in important sacred shrines along the way to Mecca. So starting from Kashgar there, oh, they might go to Bukhara, say, to visit the shrine of Nakhchivans, maybe down to Bulk, to Isfahan, uh, to Baghdad, um, to Damascus, to Jerusalem, and finally down to Mecca. On the return route, they might travel by sea to Cairo and up to Istanbul. Extraordinary, long, long, complex journeys lasting many years. Istanbul was such a regular stopping point that between the 17th and 19th centuries, excuse me, between the 17th and 19th centuries, 
there was a cluster of Sufi lodges called the Bukhari Tekes. They were specifically to house Sufis from Central Asia who were passing through on the Hajj. And we also know that some of these wayfarers chose to stay in Istanbul. In the district of Eyüp in Istanbul, which is still today an important pilgrimage site, there is a, a lesser known tomb. Uh, it belongs to Abdullah Nidai Kashgari. Um, he came from the city of Yadkent uh, in the Uyghur homeland. He made the long journey to Mecca in the mid-18th century. He settled in Istanbul and went on to become a spiritual leader of a Naqshbandi lodge in Istanbul. Nidai wrote two books, a Divan and a Risale-i Hakia. Uh, you can still find copies of his books in the Sulaymaniyya Library. And in them he described his journey, his long journey to Mecca, and also his intense longing for home. So Nidai's journey in many ways collapses those boundaries between physical and spiritual traveling, and also these different types of journeys. He was a calendar, that itinerant dervish. He undertook the Hajj. He went on ziaret, and he became a teacher of the path, uh, the Tereket Yol, in Istanbul, where he continued to remember his hometown of Yarkand, feeling like a musafir in exile. And while we reflect on all these layers of journeys and memories, these feedback loops of faith and place, uh, we can even take a step further and recall the legend of the saints whose tombs Nidai was remembering, the, these seven Muhammads, buried in their seven great tombs. Um, that pilgrimage site, until a few years ago, was one of the largest and busiest shrines in the Uyghur region. And the seven Muhammads are believed to have come from the region of Mecca in the time of the Prophet. According to legend, they traveled the world in search of their own graves and finally found them in Yadkent. And when we think of this story, we can see that for almost as long as Uyghurs have been telling stories about themselves, these stories have involved journeys, both physical and spiritual. So let's pull back from the history and back into the present. I want to loop back to where we left that powerful video of dance and spoken word curated by Mukades Mijit uh, and think again about the ways that young Uyghurs, the inheritors of these traditions, are engaging creatively with their experience of exile. This young woman here uh, now goes by the name of Yingil Mes. She arrived in Istanbul in 2016. Uh, she is the daughter of another line of Sufi followers from Kashgar. Um, we interviewed her and she told us how she was raised in an intense atmosphere of underground Sufi gatherings uh, she also trained as a Quranic reciter. Uh, let me show you a quick clip of a, a recording session, an informal recording session we did in the family's Istanbul flat. Here she's demonstrating a hikmet. This is one of the songs that were performed in women's Sufi gatherings in Kashgar. <laughs> I was amazed by this performance. 
really the histories of Sufi journeys are inscribed in it. Uh, the lyrics, the song is attributed to Meshrep, again, that merry dervish uh, who wandered between Yerkent and Bukhara in the 17th century. And, and the melody itself carries the traces of more recent migrations, uh, those of the Nakhshbandi Sufis from Uzbekistan to Kashgar. It sounds very Uzbek, that melody, doesn't it? Um, but as well as these histories, then, um, what really interests me is what um, she's doing now with this remarkable voice of hers. So she's, she's found a new husband in Istanbul, like so many of the other Uyghur women. Uh, this guy is a, a guitarist, a Uyghur guitarist, who now goes by the name of Kilic. Uh, he actually had some commercial success in a pop band in Beijing in the 1990s. But now the two of them have come together from quite different backgrounds, and they are producing a series of contemporary songs which are really responding directly to the oppression of the Uyghurs in their homeland. And there are really not many people in exile doing this right now. Um, perhaps because of her Sufi background, um, she doesn't seem to find a conflict between her position as a Quran teacher and her role as a singer. Uh, and more remarkably, the Uyghur community in Istanbul, which is really dominated by more uh, conservative religious people, uh, the community now seem to have embraced their songs. There was criticism around their first releases, uh, or rather they criticized his, the husband for allowing his wife to sing in public. <laughs> Um, but now it seems that they are more widely accepted, uh, I think because of the powerful political message their songs convey. And now they're planning to reach out more widely. They're singing in English and also in Arabic and trying to make new connections and engage new audiences. So this uh, is one of their recent songs. It's called Yanarim Yok, No Road Back Home. It's a very affecting song with an interesting backstory. It's a setting of a poem uh, which was believed to be written by the professor of literature, Abdul Qadir Jalaluddin, an old friend of ours. Um, Jalaluddin was detained in 2018 and is still not released, as far as we know. Uh, but these lyrics, they surfaced on Uyghur social networks in 2020, and they were said to have been written by Jalaluddin actually inside the camps and somehow smuggled out, memorized perhaps, and then written down uh, by, by someone he knew in the camp. Who knows? It's, it's, a, it's a crazy story, but it was very um, influential on, on the Uyghur social media networks. Uh, so the title then, No Road Back Home. But actually, I argue that this song works to counter against that, uh, against its own title. It's making that road, it's creating that road through the effective connections forged by text and melody. So I, I'm going to end this presentation by playing you out with this song, and I hope it doesn't make too many people try, uh, cry. It does it for me sometimes. But before we end, um, I need to say a few thank yous. Uh, first to Shane McCausland, thank you very much, to uh, the head of the School of Arts for his generous support for this event and kind words. Um, to Jerry Glasgow and Georgie Pope um, for such an outstanding tech support and organisation, thank you so much. Uh, to the wonderful Silk Road Collective, Rahim M. Mahmoud, you can clap now by the way, yes? <laughs> Yeah, Rahim and Mahmoud, Sardo, Mirza Hojaev, Li Chung, Imogen Fo, and uh, a special guest with the ensemble this time, my wonderful colleague Said Kord Mafi. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, to Mukha Des Midget, uh, the scholar, filmmaker, and artist, constant inspiration. Thank you for coming for this. Uh, and last but not least, to my husband and constant research partner, Aziz El Issa Elkwin. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave the last word to Yingil Mess and Kilich. 
Uh, and do feel free to, to leave and find your way to some um, refreshments that I think we've laid on. Geceleri, geceleri, kara bastı, kara bastı, tumarım yok, tumarım yok. Bu hayattır, özge yana, tumarım yok. Cimcitlıkta, hiyal ezdi, amalım yok. Jim <laughs> Jai bu bararım var yanarım yok. Kandak jai bu bararım var yanarım yok. Kandak jai bu bararım var yanarım yok. 